train which was crossing his path at a rather strange angle. The passenger train was travelling at 125 miles an hour and at that speed takes about a mile and a third to stop. The driver made a brake application but this wasn't nearly enough to slow his train down. This is a model of one of the coaches of which the passenger train consisted. They were built in the 1970s. The designers were instructed to build a coach which would travel at 125 miles an hour, which was rather faster than coaches had been travelling in, in the UK up until then. But they didn't design it to be any safer. The jolts felt by the passengers had been the application of the emergency brakes. But then the first impact took place. During the first 0.9 of a second, massive shock waves passed down the train as the engine pushed aside the first of the yellow hoppers. By this stage, no passenger coaches had been hit. But this would only last so long. When one of the 22-ton hoppers was not struck heavily enough to push it clear, it rocked back in towards Michael's window at the front of the first coach at a closing speed of 70 miles an hour. Until this moment, the engine had been shielding Janice and Michael's coach. But now it had been derailed, they would face a head-on collision. I was going to die, and the first thing I shouted... But then, two seconds into the crash, as the engine was derailing, a small part of a hopper's undercarriage was breaking free. It was propelled by the energy left in the crashing wagon to a point that would radically alter the outcome of the Southall rail crash. The front coach, which had been facing a head-on impact, was derailed by the debris landing in its path. And still traveling at over 60 miles an hour, it began to topple onto its side. The coach slid on its side for less than four seconds. In the opening seconds of the crash, the front coach had been in most danger until its derailment meant it avoided the head-on collision. But what was of benefit to most people in that coach had terrible consequences for those behind. The second coach was now exposed to the oncoming hoppers. The situation now is that the power car is still moving but is completely derailed. The first coach has turned over on its side, become uncoupled from the second coach and is sliding along an adjacent track. And it means the second coach is approaching the line of wagons which are stationary. The second coach is still coupled to the third and fourth and fifth coaches and this is beginning to involve them much more directly in the accident. This is going to be a, a very considerable collision. The impact between the hopper and the coach in front of David would not happen at once. The hopper was now stationary, waiting for the oncoming train. While the gap closed, no other impacts took place. Here, in the midst of the collision, two seconds had opened up. In crash terms, this is a considerable length of time. For the rest of the world, these seconds went. In this collision, four seconds into the crash, lives were almost certainly lost in the front of the second coach. Yet more was to come. The hopper had been lifted into the air directly towards a structure at the side of the track. The line had recently been electrified and as part of this electrification along either side of the track there had been erected steel stanchions which are there to support the overhead line equipment which we call the knitting sometimes 
um, which provides the power to the, the electric trains. But the part that a stanchion played in this accident, I don't think could ever have been foreseen. The hopper jackknifes with Coach H, lifts into the air, but can only get round as far as the overhead line stanchion, which is there, and stops there. And at that stage, the second coach, which is being propelled by the others, pushes its way underneath it, and the hopper falls onto the leading end of the second coach, pinning the coach beneath the hopper. It can't go anywhere, but there's no doubt there's an awful lot of energy still left in that train, which has got to go somewhere. What would cause such devastation to the second coach had already been decided by an event that took place two seconds into the crash. The hopper wagon that impacted with Michael's window had continued to tear down the length of the second coach. The second coach carried this weakness through the crash. On its own, it would have meant little. But the toppling of the first coach that led to the head-on impact, that led to the stanchion and the pinning of the front of the train, all conspired to produce a fate previously unimaginable. The coach bent in half. This was a catastrophe for those inside. Yet for David and those sat near him, this was, purely in collision terms, the ideal crash scenario. As the carriage bent, it absorbed the energy that would otherwise have threatened the third coach. Eight and a half seconds after first impact. From the second coach, four were already dead and a fifth would die later in hospital. Two had died in the first coach. 139 passengers were injured, but alive. 